Hey Church, we are so happy to have you with us today. If you're new with us this week, we're so grateful that you took the time to tune in with us. Our team would love it if you could be active in the comments. Just let us know how you're doing, what you took away from the message. We love to hear from you and chat with you in that way online. We love you. Enjoy the service. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your Till I 
Hi everyone. I can't believe another week has gone by. It's gone so quickly. I find the older I get, the faster the time goes. Anyways, it's been a good week and I hope uh, yours has been as well. Today's uh, reading I found in Proverbs chapter 11. And the title is, How Can We Achieve Financial Security? One of the great deceptions of wealth is the false sense of security that it gives. If the stock market crashes, millionaires can become paupers in one day. Also, there will come a time when we will have to account for our lives before God. On that day, our money will be utterly useless. A person whose hope is in riches is headed for a fall. Only when we trust in God do we have true security. Money is a big part of life, so the book of Proverbs offers principles that we can apply to our finances. First, we should recognize that whatever we have is not ours, but is the result of God's blessing. That means we should hold our money with an open hand and give generously. God expects us to honor him with our wealth, returning to him a portion of our first fruits by giving to his work on a planned, consistent, and priority basis. Second, we should work hard, earning our money honestly and spending it frugally. God hates dishonest business practices, but delights in those who conduct their financial affairs with integrity and honesty. Third, we should save in the good times as preparation for future times of need, retirement, unemployment, college, or another time when our income might be reduced. Whoever gathers money, little by little, makes it grow. And if you'd like to look at that, it's Proverbs chapter 11, verses 25 to 28. You can bring your tithes to Angela at 2 Oxford Street West, uh, Monday to Friday between 10 and 4, or you can contribute at salvationist.ca. Thanks and have a great week. Hi friends. Well, thanks for joining us online. Um, recently, our Wednesday night Bible study group has begun studying the book of Hebrews. So we're two weeks in. Last week, we studied the bigness of God's son, Jesus. We looked at how he is fully God. We looked at how he um, is majestic and mighty and powerful and sovereign and holy. And this week, well, we studied Jesus who draws close to us. We studied how he is truly and properly man. Um, when we looked at this book, we looked at how Jesus is our liberator, he, how he is our champion and hero and how he is also our great high priest. He is able to identify with us in every way. When we understand Jesus to be all of these things, it's so much easier for us to enter into a personal relationship with him, more than just engaging in a mere religion. And that is what we're after. In fact, this book, the Bible, from cover to cover, is all about knowing God. He is there for you. He loves you. He wants to protect you and have beautiful fellowship with you. You were created to walk with God and to bring him glory. Um, when we look at the Bible, we see great examples of people who had tremendous personal relationships with God um, that were characterized by deep intimacy. We look at someone like Abraham and we understand that he was called a friend of God. We look at Moses, and I love the story of Moses and um, his life of leadership. Uh, Moses had what we call mountaintop experiences with God, where he enjoyed the presence of God in a way that was just unheard of before and incredible. And um, I love the, the part in Moses' journey when he says that he doesn't want to go anywhere that God's presence isn't going as well, isn't going with him. And I know for myself in my life, I don't want to be, I don't want to go anywhere that he isn't leading. Um, that's the safest place that we can be, is in the presence of God and following after his heart. Um, I love this story at the end of Moses' life when, uh, well, he was a great leader, definitely a great leader, but not a perfect one, as we know. And so if you haven't read his the story of his life, then I would encourage you to do so. There's so much there in the Old Testament and uh, check it out in Exodus and Deuteronomy. But um, we see this picture at the end of his life and again it's another mountaintop experience where I imagine that he's just there with God. God is showing him a vision of the promised land that his people will be entering 
And I imagine that there is this, this transaction that's taking place between Moses and God, where they're just kind of looking back over the course of, of this lifetime that they've shared together. And, you know, remembering, remembering the moments, the, the wonders, remembering all the ways that God showed up for them and what was accomplished together in this relationship and, um, and just the intimacy that I picture, you know, and it's a beautiful thing. I, I, one day when I'm at the end of my life, I want to have those moments with God where we look back, I, I sometimes have them now, <laughs> where we look back and I'm just in awe of who he is and what he's done and how he's allowed me to partner with him. And, you know, there will also be the moments that we reflect on where God has just held me, held me in difficult places and um, has sheltered me with his wings. And so um, Moses had a very special relationship with God. And so did David. David was called a man after God's own heart. And we see in scripture that David wrote, this one thing I ask, to dwell in the house of the Lord forever. You know, like that's pretty amazing. That's pretty incredible. If you could ask God one thing, is that what it would be? That you could dwell in his house, in other words, to be in his presence forever? Um, there's something pretty special there between David and God. And then we see Paul. Paul said, for me to live is, is Christ and to die is gain. Well, that's a pretty incredible statement, if there ever was one. Then there's Jesus. And Jesus taught us that one thing is necessary, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He said it was the greatest commandment. And yet, what's so scary about that is that this one thing that is necessary could be the one thing that is missing. The Bible warns us that there will be people who will get to the end of their days, to the end of their life, and they were good people, and they'll say, look at what I did. And God will say to them, um, depart from me, for I, don't, for I never knew you. Be warned that Satan, the enemy of our soul, will do everything he can to distract you, even good things that will keep you from pursuing fellowship with God. Looking at these great people in the Bible, we can wonder, well, how did they get this kind of relationship, this intimate fellowship with God? In Proverbs 3, verse 32, it says, He is intimate with the upright. This simply means that an intimate relationship is developed between God and those who are willing to walk righteously before Him. Do you know Him? Do you enjoy Him? What we're after is closeness, a deep, personal, confidential relationship with Jesus. And it's God's desire to have this kind of relationship with every single believer. If you've never experienced unconditional love in an earthly relationship, it can be pretty difficult to fathom what that could be like with a Heavenly Father. But this is what we know about intimacy. Intimate relationships are not selfish. They are motivated by love for one another that is genuine. Intimacy with God involves depth. It goes way beyond getting saved, although that's the first step. Maturity in our relationship with God involves not being tossed back and forth like the waves on the sea, only running to God when we have a problem or when we're in trouble. Um, intimacy with God is marked by reading the Bible, hearing his voice through his word, um, spending time talking to him in prayer, not just talking to him, but listening to what he has to say too. It involves being open and honest with God, um, sharing a oneness with him. And all of this doesn't just happen. It takes time to develop and nurture, just like human relationships do too. But most of all, it involves an acceptance, an acceptance of who God is and who we are too. The person who is growing in intimacy with God recognizes that God is at the center of their life, that they are seeking the will of God, the purposes of God, and the plans of God. Our Wednesday night Bible study group talked about what it's like for the believer to live in the now, but not yet. So we believe the promises of God, 
but have not yet experienced the full consummation of those promises. So in other words, we live in a fallen world and, um, and we still struggle with a sinful nature, a carnal nature that would lead us astray at times. And so this intimate relationship we have with God is so very important for us to recognize that Jesus, the great high priest, has been tempted in every way and has overcome. And so the power of Christ in us is that we too can become overcomers. And when we, when we fall, we can experience the forgiveness and the grace and the mercy of this great high priest. Finally, our Wednesday night group looked at the big problem we often encounter in our faith, that our visibility gets in the way of our vision. Well, I really love listening to Dr. Charles Stanley, and I remember an illustration that he shared from his own life. He talked about being a young preacher, and he was uh, going through a particularly discouraging time. A woman from his church called and said she wanted to meet him for lunch. And then after that, she wanted him to come back to her place because she wanted to show him something. He said, well, considering she was in her 70s and he was only in his 30s, he really wasn't too concerned, so he said, sure. So he met this woman for lunch and afterwards went back to her place. And when he got there, she said, don't take off your shoes. Come with me. I want to show you something. So she led him into a room where there was a big picture of Daniel and the lion's den. And she said to him, I want you to tell me what you see. So he looked at the picture and he started to describe the lions. He started to describe, oh, one is looking in this direction and one is looking down. There were bones on the ground. He commented on everything he saw in the picture. And um, she said to him, is that it? Is that everything you see? And he said, it is. And she said, okay, I want you to notice Daniel. I want you to notice that Daniel isn't looking at the lions. There's a stream of light coming down and Daniel is looking up because he has his eyes fixed on Jesus. Well, friends, isn't it true that when we focus on our problems and we focus on the struggles and we focus on the sin that so easily entangles us and all the things around us that would steal our joy, that would threaten to hold us down, um, that sometimes we are also experiencing this problem of visibility. We're seeing, we're looking at what's right in front of us, and we're forgetting about the vision, the vision of God that is before us. And so Hebrews invites us to fix our eyes on Jesus. He invites us to experience the peace that comes from knowing God, from this intimate relationship of a God who understands and empathizes with every struggle that we face. Friends, I pray that today you would find peace with God, that you would find joy in your salvation, that you would experience um, the vibrancy that comes with a, an intimate relationship with Jesus. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, today we thank you that you are truly and properly God and truly and properly man. Sometimes it's hard for me to even fathom that a God who is so big and so holy could care so deeply about the details of my life and the life of each one of us. Father, I thank you for the fact that you are a God who initiates. God, you, you pursue the people that you have created, the people that you love. God, I thank you today that the Creator loves that which he created. God, I pray that you would give us a genuine desire, um, a hunger and a thirst for more of you. God, that we wouldn't be after the things that you would accomplish for us, but God, we simply want to be in your presence. God, we simply want to know you more and to know you better. Father, we pray your blessing upon each one. In Jesus' name, amen.